Good morning, afternoon, or evening, and welcome to the Bloody Disgusting Network. The following show is just horrifying. Beware. You're obsessed with her, and you're obsessed with her daughter! All right, easy, Geraldo. And welcome back to Horror Queers. We're talking boys with tails, we're talking revisionist fairy tales, and we're talking murderous old biddies. And I'm Joe. Hello, I'm Shelley Duvall. And welcome to Fairy Tale Queerter. Tonight's tale is a story of forbidden love and forbidden existence, wolves in priest's clothing, and of course, squeezing a gun trigger real gentle, like a woman's titty. We are discussing, obviously, the wolves of Cromer. Oh yes, <laughs> obviously, yes. <laughs> oh man, Joe. I'm um, sorry, I'm Trace, everyone. I'm not actually Shelley all. Are you sure? Are you sure? You, <laughs> it felt like you were channeling something there. The entire time I was like, this is fairy tale theater, <laughs> but just with gay people. Okay, so explain what fairy tale theater is for folks who don't know. Yeah, the fairy tale theater, it was this show in like the mid 80s, and it was on Showtime, actually, not HBO. Okay. Oh my god, I thought it was HBO. That just had fairy, fa- it was retellings of fairy tales, not adult, like, <laughs> lest the uh, Showtime uh, label confuse you. Um, mm-hmm. This is very much a show for children, but it was hosted by Shelley Duvall, so she would bookend every episode like with her little, hello, I'm Shelley Duvall. She's not British. Um, <laughs> and then we'd get this kind of like pr- like 30 minute production maybe an hour even of uh this fairy tale and the aesthetic of this film the wolves of cromer very much reminds me of that or like these really simple morality tales that they would show us in vacation bible school when i was growing up okay yes um so folks this is a bit of a fascinating pick this is a first time watch for both of us mm-hmm. and I think I programmed this because when I was looking at the schedule, I was like, we should get a foreign film in here somewhere. (laughs) And I I was looking around and I was like, oh, this one sounds interesting. It's it's got a lot of fans of it. It's simple. It's independent. And I don't know exactly what I was expecting. But as soon as I put it on and it kind of has that. I I don't want to say BBC because I actually think it's closer to kind of like PBS. PBS, Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, like the lighting is soft and maybe a little Vaseline. It's from 1998, but you could easily believe it's from the 80s. I was even going to say the 70s. Oh, actually, you know what? That's probably even better. But I don't know. Like, in some ways, I'm like, this could be our shortest episode ever because it could be five minutes to say, like, this is what the film's doing. Good night, everyone. <laughs> the end. <laughs> Okay, and actually, so because the, the good segue though, because everyone, this is a film that um is relatively obscure. It is available to stream, but we're gonna use this moment uh, because it is on a streaming platform called Deku, and this is a queer entertainment streaming service. And we normally don't discuss where things are streaming because licenses change all the time. And so you know, if someone's listening to this episode in a year, it may not be the same. Right. I'm fairly confident this will still be on Deku in a year, but you know. Well, yeah, and really, it's not available on physical release like it's it's relatively hard to get as more than a dvd and the dvds are quite pricey so yeah you know if you have an opportunity to maybe go and support a little indie streamer that would be great and folks we're going to give you a heads up that we're also going to program a micro queers episode this week that's also available on deku so if you do a three-day trial you can get in there access a couple of things and then get out Yes, and let's reiterate that three-day trial, and also reiterate, by the way, y'all, we are not being paid for this promotion. This is just our honest-to-goodness uh, uh, Good Samaritan ship, plugging a, a really important queer streaming service. But also, Deku, for all of your gay entertainment needs, we are available for ads. <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now, oh yeah, yeah, by all means, please reach out to us. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> I will say though, so like, I mean, I watched it on my on my my Deku app on my Roku, and um, just looking at the library, like, a lot of the covers are, of, like, their programming is very similar when it's just, like, two men that are shirtless, mm-hmm. like, draped over each other. <laughs> 
I don't know what you're talking about. Yes. <laughs> it actually reminds me of how Netflix sometimes like caters their images and like the stills that they'll pick yes. from movies based on what your viewing habits are like. So if you're watching too much queer stuff, all of a sudden you'll get completely out of context pictures of like shirtless men from mm-hmm. movies. And you're like, that's not even the main character. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. God forbid you watch a lot of gay shit and then have Riverdale on your list. <laughs> Why am I just looking at KJ Appa's abs all the time now? <laughs> but um, but yeah, the wolves of Cromer. I mean, it, it, on top of it just, you know, being kind of hard to find, it's, it is a bit of an odd pick because... I think maybe both of us expected it to lean a little more horror-y or werewolf-y than what we got. Yes, yeah. Although if you look at the reviews, a lot of people will talk about how it's not quite a gentle film, but this actually feels like you could show this to preteens or teenagers and kind of be like, hey, gay kids, it's going to be okay. Except for that ending, in which case it's not okay at all. Uh, well, kind. It's like a it's like a mix with a Shakespearean tragedy almost. A little bit. Oh, a little Romeo and Juliet hardcore. Yeah. Very much so. But no, I mean, and th- that's where I was kind of coming from with my vacation Bible school stuff because I was like, hey, this movie is seventy six minutes long. It is not that long of a movie. I do mm-hmm. think it really feels longer and. It's not really with the gay stuff. It's more so of how much time we spend with these old biddies plotting this woman's demise. (laughs) (laughs) It's like arsenic and old lace over here. I was just like, oh my God, I get what they're doing. Like, whatever. But but yeah, this is very much a morality tale. And like, like oh, y'all, like, look, don't judge a book by its cover. Don't Mm -hmm. scapegoat. Like, blah, 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 blah. Um, Don't be hypocritical. So it feels very much like something that I would have watched in my, you know, religious upbringing. Just with additions of, well, I'm sorry, I was going to say gay sex, um, gay love and one straight sex scene. Yeah, that that to me was like, is this 1998 or is this who the audience is made for? Because this is, I would say, art cinema. And to a certain extent, this is also reflective of independent national cinema. So I could have seen this coming out of Canada or Australia. Maybe I'm just thinking of films from the Commonwealth at this point. No, but but but, but like government funded that airs on like the public broadcasting network. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, that isn't to say that it's bad. It's just that it has a certain visual aesthetic and a certain kind of stagey artsiness to it. You know, this is a film that is adapted from a PhD that was turned into a play that then became this film. It's by a first-time director who was 22. So yeah, it's wearing its heart and its allegory on its sleeve. Very much so. And I will say, I do think that this film expands. I mean, it didn't feel too stagey for me, but maybe it's just because we have so many outdoor scenes. (laughs) So I'm just like, oh, look, they're outside. (laughs) I can see a hill in the distance. This isn't stagey. No, yeah. It's so stagey to it's me. It's only, no, it's only with these old bitches in the house where I'm like, oh, this is the play that, that they were watching back then. <laughs> oh, I could just imagine them setting up some fake ass boulder made of felt and it's like, this is the woods. <laughs> and then the rest of the scenes take place in the house. And it's like, this is a dining room table with four chairs around it. No, I, I, I'm totally like very minimalist and like, but, and so yeah, the movie has a chance to use the natural English countryside, which. Mm-hmm. is fine i i don't really think it's shot particularly i think it's shot kind of um oh i actually read a review that said it was pragmatic and i was like that's a really good way to put it like okay. it, it's just very like here's what we're watching here's what you're getting without really any ambition behind it and i realize it sounds like i'm really coming down on this movie hard i do i do think what you said earlier though it's like okay it is this particular type of aesthetic this particular type of filmmaking i think if you walk into it expecting something quote-unquote normal the, I, yeah i know right like what the fuck do i say maybe more studio e or more more cinematic well i think even more horror right like if you go into this expecting a horror film of queer wolf boys who are being you know hunted by quote-unquote civilized people from the town that's not what you're getting this is like a gentle love story with a couple of old women who are trying to pin murders on gay men. Um, yes, and two, I'm sorry, multiple gay boys slash wolves wearing fur coats with tails, which I actually really liked that aspect of it. <laughs> I did too. I actually saw somebody say, oh, I could see this inspiring a kind of grunge punk aesthetic in the UK. Like, can't you just imagine boys wearing this to the gay bar? 
I would wear that to the gay bar. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're going to have to work on our eyeliner game then. Oh, yeah, no, no. I mean, well, it's important to note that these actors, James Layton and Lee Williams, they are models. This is like their acting yes. debut doing this. And so, but that being said, I will say, I actually think they're, they both mm-hmm. do a good job in this movie. Like, I'm not oh, sitting yeah. here like, I mean, again, I don't, uh, I think that the level of acting required for something like this isn't really very high. But right. That being said, I actually think, yeah, I thought they were really good in it. And I do think that the old biddies, Margaret Towner and Rita Davies, they're like classically trained, like British, like stage royalty. I can totally see it because I think they have so much fun with their dialogue. Like they are where a lot of the comedy lies in this film for me in their line delivery, in their really combative frenemy style relationship. I was having a lot of fun with that, although I don't know, again, if that's because I have a kind of British sense of humor. So I I just found a lot of that dialogue very cutting and bitchy and very funny. I no, I, I do get that. It, it worked sometimes for me. It didn't work sometimes for me. It, it, this is also a thing where um the music employed here kind of reminds me of oh I'm gonna say Charles Band like type things. Oh, we're back to Charles Band references. Okay, or, okay. or even something trauma y where I'm kind of mm-hmm. like uh the music it, it it sounds like they just kind of paid money to have stop music put in and it doesn't really work. It takes me right out of the film and this is like a totally like a personal thing for me where it's like when I hear whatever type of music this is. I'm I don't even know how to describe it. I'm just kind of like, ugh, like I'm immediately pulled out of this film. How dare you? That EDM in the beach scene is epic. <laughs> well, of course, then you, when you have, uh, okay, so bearing the lead here, Boy George is the narrator for this film. For what, five seconds? That's what I said. I was like, cool, it's a fairy tale. Like, once I did more research before I even watched it, I was like, cool, okay, we're going to have, a, it's a fairy tale. That's mm-hmm. what we're getting. And yes. Boy George is going to pop in and out be it voiceover or like as an actual like physical narrator Mm -hmm. nope he narrates the opening seconds of this movie (laughs) yeah so much so that i actually i forgot about that because i was taking notes and i didn't write that part down and then when i went back through i was like where is boy george (laughs) and i had to restart the movie and realize oh he is literally doing an introduction that lasts under 10 seconds yes that is exactly it and i think he has top billing (laughs) to which i say get that money so joe we, we've already kind of discussed our overall thoughts of this but like what w- what did you think of this film like i mean I, we know how i felt i'm kind of like in the middle like i'm like oh it's okay like I, I i it's a movie that i think is has really good intentions behind it i think what mm-hmm. it's trying to do is really admirable i mostly have a problem with the execution yeah i'm i'm pretty much right there with you i admire it more than i like it but Mm -hmm. i'm not unhappy that we watched it i also don't know that i would ever watch it again and i'm it's it would be like a gentle recommend like i hope people watch this for the podcast and i think some people will probably get a lot out of it because they're gonna find the romance cute or the messaging sweet And it's a pleasant diversion, but I can't see this becoming somebody's absolute favorite film. I like what you said about admiring it more than liking it, because that is exactly how I feel. But you're right. I think more so this is respectable to me, too, because it came out in 1998. It's very sweet. Uh, I think that the little button on the end with Wolf Heaven is great. My Mm -hmm. big issue is that even though it's just 76 minutes long, I do feel like this movie tries to incorporate a lot of different allegories. To the point where it feels overstuffed, but also, like, it's all so on the nose. Everything in this movie, I mean, it is not subtle at all. (laughs) No, you're right. And actually, I I have an academic article that kind of touches on some of what it's trying to do. Because, of course, uh, folks, if you haven't gathered, Trey said it, this is a fairy tale narrative. It is a modern contemporary twist on Little Red Riding Hood. And interestingly enough, I found an article that kind of ties this into Freeway, Trace. Okay, so that's... uh, uh, Who would have thought that we would have covered two Little Red Riding Hood, like, films in the span of three months? (laughs) I know, right? And folks, like, we plan this, but we don't plan it this well no we didn't know <laughs> i thought this was a werewolf movie <laughs> yeah exactly 
because that's what you think when you go into it. So yeah. So I found this article. It's called Little Red Riding Hood Crime Films, Criminal Themes and Critical Variations by Pauline Greenhill and Stephen oh. Com. And they positioned this film as part of a 90s crime development. So they say the emergence of a postmodern absurdist aesthetic in American filmmaking during this period is basically because of Quentin Tarantino and the Coen brothers. So uh. those two... I was going to say filmmakers, but I guess the Coen brothers are multiple filmmakers. So those three <laughs> filmmakers, they they basically strike gold doing this kind of formula. So it's like crime is in, it's really popular, but it's also not your grandmother's crime film. So they open up these cultural spaces for considering mm-hmm. alternative perspectives on crime. And then these films seem to reflect the traditional pattern of evil being defeated and morality restored so it's like there's this template that a lot of films will tackle and then quentin tarantino and the coen brothers kind of gently start to play around with that and this is particularly new to the 90s where this new criminal stereotype is also taking hold in the public imagination and that is the idea of a super predator who is more monster than human who is psychopathic who is sexually deviant and ubiquitous and we touched on this in silence of the lambs and copycat and seven and i definitely see it in freeway so everything you did, which I mean I, I don't remember if we discussed like yeah like p- how Pulp Fiction probably influenced Freeway mm-hmm. um, or, or Tarantino in general but I can totally see that and also explains why that movie is as depraved as it is but yeah sorry continue continue I want to hear more of this okay so uh, that's actually a fantastic segue because thinking specifically about Red Riding Hood as a fairy tale that you can use for this so the the fairy tale itself has this doubling and overlapping of figures and that's part of the reason why Little Red Riding Hood it tends to work well for crime films because the plot and the central images of the tale um they they specifically relate to law breaking and or criminality right like it's mm-hmm. basically the story of a girl who uh, I mean, it's like a B and E and a twisted like reversal of expectations. Yeah, I mean, it, it, or you can limit it down to like don't trust strangers, you know, for children. Right. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So we've got this familiar narrative, and then you can start to impose, like, you start to think about this doubling uh, with wolves and innocents, predators and victims, mm-hmm. villains and heroes, and it really affords this opportunity for filmmakers where they can subvert the audience expectation for a storybook ending. So it's like, you know how Little Red Riding Hood ends, but what happens if it doesn't, if we start to critique it, and we start to apply things about the causes and consequences of crime? Huh. So we start to get character multiplication that helps to complicate the obvious attribution of blame and guilt. And this is where people will say, like, okay, so that like that's why we've got in Freeway the Reese Witherspoon character. It's like we think that she's responsible for crime because she's young, but she's also Red Riding Hood. Like she's meant to be the hero, right? You know, and I remember like, when we read Ebert's review for that. Like his one critique of the film was that it was too like. Uh, oh my god, not loyal to the story, too um, uh, too reliant on the story's formula. So if you mm-hmm. know a little bit of Riding Hood, you know the direction that film is going to go from the get-go. <laughs> Which I completely disagree with. Okay, People well, can so, listen so, to me so talk about that. On, on, a, on, a, on a basic <laughs> narrative level, you yeah. know that he's going to get to Grandma's house. You know that he's going right. to possibly eat or kill Grandma. And that, you know, the little bit of Riding Hood is going to, like, uh, maybe the Axeman or whatever, the, the, the Huntsman, is mm-hmm. going to come and, like, kill the wolf. Right. Yes. Th- so, and that that movie does follow that structure. Whereas in this one, we have oh, the wolves aren't the actual bad guys. Exactly right. So it's the wolves aren't bad, and the people who are accusing them are actually the hypocrites. But also, even the wolves themselves have like this internalized. I mean, this article calls it lycanthrophobia, which I was <laughs> like, that's <laughs> okay. a mouthful. But the film Wolves of Crummer specifically tackles these questions of truth, right? Like, I was thinking back because I hadn't realized it until I read it in the piece. We don't actually know who kills Grandma, like Mrs. Drax. We assume that it's the insulin, but then there's a suggestion that someone has bitten her legs. So was it the wolves after all? I see. And I thought it was the old women that were like, let's bite her. <laughs> so like, because because we have from the get go, oh, let's blame the wolves, which mm-hmm. uh, I mean, okay, the allegory of many is the AIDS 
allegory, right? Because we, oh, sure. we have them call it saying, oh, the wolves carry diseases, blah, blah, blah. And then it's also, hey, we're going to kill this old woman, but let's blame the wolves, mm-hmm. a.k.a. oh, let's pin this disease on the gays. Yes. In case you couldn't tell. And that's really what the article ends up coming to the idea of is like it is addressing this like oh the wolves are not what you expect and there's like internalized like anthrophobia yeah. but at the end of the day the film is mostly interested in issues of hypocrisy and homophobia which i mean yeah that 100 percent makes sense and internalized homophobia slash lycanthrophobia <laughs> Yes, indeed. We're just going <laughs> to call it homophobia, y'all. We're not going to keep saying lycanthrophobia because I, I like hint. No. no I... <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, okay, so Trace, tell me the very brief story of how this film came to be. Yeah, I mean, so this movie, it, pre- it, it is a 1998 film. It premiered at the San Francisco International Lesbian and Gay Film Festival in 1998, but mm-hmm. it wasn't released in theaters, and by theaters, I'm going to assume that is a very tiny number of theaters, in December of 2000. So we're looking at a runtime of 76 minutes, although everything reported said 82, so I don't know where that discrepancy is coming from. Mm-mm. A budget of fourteen million dollars? Question mark? Question mark? Question mark? Question mark? Significant question marks with that figure. Yeah, I was gonna say fourteen thousand to be honest, but <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's maybe a little mean. No, 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 no. But I mean, like, I, there's not fourteen million dollars on this, unless these actors really yeah. cost that much. So I, I think this oh, is misreporting no. because there just isn't a lot of information about this film. It did supposedly gross. <laughs> I have all these clarifiers. Um, <laughs> supposedly gross eleven thousand one hundred dollars in the states and Canada, and had a worldwide gross of just over five hundred thousand dollars. Right. So I mean, but you know, like I, I wouldn't expect this to have a wide release to make a lot of money. But just no queer shit aside, just again, given this aesthetic that we've been discussing for the past twenty minutes. Yeah. I mean, if anything, it, it reminded me a little bit of Hellbent when we were having mm-hmm. our um our conversation back last pride oh gosh like a year ago oh my god it was a year ago I, actually no this this is like the one year anniversary of that episode because i think that was our first june episode last year uh-huh. but this feels very reflective of the kind of independent queer cinema that we were seeing at the end of the 90s where it it doesn't have the the big name cast it's got a lower budget again with that 14 <laughs> yeah um, we're assuming so <laughs> but i think what ends up happening is these films end up getting rescued and getting a bit of a minor cult status because of the rise of streaming services and places like Deco and Mubi. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think even things like Amazon Prime have covered like some of these queer horror shorts that we've been doing for micro queers. Like there are outlets for them now. So it feels like this is the generation that came right before there was this massive audience that was like, oh, we need content. Who's got queer films? Because we know that there's a minor audience for that and we'll just use it to supplement our reserves. Well, and so, yeah, you're 100% right. And when it comes to even the reception of this, so I mean, I saw, I I did find a couple reviews that were not on Rotten Tomatoes um, from 2000, actually, that that referred to this as a festival favorite. Like, I think that people really enjoyed... well, I was going to say the happiness of this movie, but it really has a downer. Well, a downer ending that's like uplifted by heaven. Right. Um, <laughs> Literal heaven, folks, if you haven't seen it. But that being said, though, um, there are five reviews of this on Rotten Tomatoes, all of which are negative. So I think this might be oh. our first 0% film that we've covered. Oh, that makes me sad. This is right? not a 0% film, folks. Like, no, this isn't my favorite film, but this is a, a kind of cute film. We have covered films that have made me far angrier because this movie... Oh my <laughs> god, sorry. yes. This movie didn't make me angry, but <laughs> some of the movies we have have. Um, <laughs> we're looking at a 5.6 out of 10 on Letterboxd, though, which th- that to me is more in line yes. with my with my score. Mm-hmm. And I, like, I've seen people talk about how they fell in love with this movie, how the boys are so gorgeous, how they really respect its messaging. And I think those are all the clear takeaways for me. Like we said that this film is quite obvious in its allegory and what it's trying to do. But I think for a lot of people, that's also exactly what they want, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, but yeah, I mean, honestly, production, I don't really have a lot of information. Just reiterating what you said, uh, writer, director, uh, I'm sorry, writer Charles Lambert is a former economist whose PhD thesis served as the basis for the play The Wolves of Cromer, which is what this film is based on. And um, it's directed by a man named Will Gould. And this is his only directing credit. Yeah, I, hmm. I feel a little bit bad because I 
I think that the script is reasonably smart. I do think it could have been strengthened or given a bit more of a polish. For me, the direction is where the film, if it is being let down, is falling apart a little bit. Because it's just, it's so stilted. Well, that's what I was saying too about the way that, that, that pragmatic cinematography, right? Like, it's just very flat. Like, mm-hmm. just there, there's no style on display here. Maybe that's too harsh. Like, it's not that there's no style. There's just really <laughs> limited style on display here. Because, yeah, it just seems like they're like, hey, cool, yeah, let's film this script. Um, and. Yeah. You know that that is a valid critique, I think, and uh, that is what it is. I, I would still argue that the this the screenplay could use a bit more nuance, but <laughs> you know, yes, yes, it it did. I did find a couple of like individual kind of blog posts of reviews of it, and there there were some people who were not feeling very generous about how completely obvious the messaging is. I mean. And the... It is that, and that is a problem I have with it. Like, did I roll my eyes a few times watching this? Yes. But again, there's that whole thing where I'm like, but I admire it for doing this. Sure. Yeah. I don't think it's a deal breaker. No, but I, but I, I too looked up some, I looked up Letterboxd reviews too, and there were so many one stars from people that were like, ew, it's like such like low budget trash. It's not even good. It's really boring, blah, blah, blah. And I was like... I, it's no. like, like, let's say this is a Lifetime movie, you know? Don't you go into a Lifetime movie with a different set of expectations? Like knowing what this movie is, I have to like judge it on its own terms. And so even right. on that, I'm like, yes, like it, it will not be for everybody, but mm-hmm. I, I know what type of movie this is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe a special. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but yeah, so, okay. That, that's really it. So why don't we, for anyone who hasn't seen the movie yet, as we've gone on for 25 minutes, t- tell us what this is about, Joe. Let's go through this plot. All right. So we open, as we mentioned with a voiceover, the barest of voiceovers from Boy George. And <laughs> once he, upon a and, time. Once upon a time, yeah. So we are literally getting this fairy tale language. And we are told that the story takes place in Cromer. And our leads are immediately introduced. We have dark and moody Gabriel, who is played by James Layton. And mm-hmm. he is a wolf who lives on the outside of town in the woods. And he's a slut. That's being a little bit. <laughs> no, extra. I know. No, but but that's the perception that all the other boy. I'm sorry, all the other wolves have of him. <laughs> yes, you have to remember that uh, if you are queer in this movie, you are a wolf. That's it. <laughs> I, I did see some people, and I'm gathering that this is maybe from a more contemporary perspective. Take issue with the fact that the film seems to indicate that if you are a wolf, you are queer but also that you are promiscuous. And I thought that was an interesting criticism. I mean, I do get the criticism, but I also don't think it's an invalid representation of this particular type of queer culture. Right. And I mean... Hmm. I, 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 basically, like, your model types. And m- maybe that's even me being prejudiced that's, or me being that's unfair. That's very judgmental. <laughs> no, but, I, but I'm not saying that as it's bad to be promiscuous, but I'm not... like I... I that that is what it is. I can understand that being the criticism because especially, I mean, this is coming what a decade after like the peak of the AIDS crisis. And when you have an entire disease blamed on one group of people, Mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is portray those people as promiscuous and thus disease spreading. Right. And maybe in that regard, it does make sense within the world of the film where we've got these hypocrites who are afraid primarily because these wolves are different, but also because they are perceived to be spreading their infection and their bad tendencies. So, I, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I... The thing there, too, which I, I get that this is the idea, because the whole thing is, like, everyone's so afraid of these wolves and how horrible they are and blah, blah, blah. But, like, they don't, they're not malicious. They don't do anything, which is, again, the thing. It's like, why does mm-hmm. everyone hate gay people so much? They aren't harming anybody unless, of course, we're corrupting your children. Yes, which happens in this film. <laughs> yes, it 100% does. But I also love, like, when they come across that one with a stroller and they're like, rawr. Yes. <laughs> Well, and and that to me is where I don't think people are being generous enough with how comedic this film can be at times. So I, you know, you talked about the costuming. We talked about how it's actually kind of stylish and mod. Mm -hmm. I would also argue that's part of the joke. Like, sure, you could say, oh, well, there's there's your staging. Like, this comes from a stage play because we would have the budget for a fur coat and a fake tail. That's what we can afford. But I love this idea that people are terrified of these wolves and they basically look like models with pinched ears. Yeah. It's funny. And, and, and nails. And nails. The nails are actually pretty good. Oh, yeah. No, they actually look quite good. <laughs> <laughs> That's the $14 million. 
But you're right. I mean, like, like basically, this is a hot models in fur sitting in the woods and not having sex, not having sex, but talking about sex. Yes. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, basically me in high school what no and yeah but you know that that could be kind of like a not meta thing but like yeah mirroring real life where it's like yeah you're a closeted kid in high school like wanting to have gay sex talking about gay sex looking at gay sex but not actually having gay sex for mm-hmm. some of us yes looking through the pages of wolf weekly yes oh my god <laughs> No, you are right, though. I think there is some comedy that really works here. But there's also, I mean, it, it, it's hit or miss for me. Right. So new to the proceedings is Seth, and he has recently escaped from home or maybe been kicked out because his parents have discovered who he is. He is played by Lee Williams. And basically our introduction to these boys is just that they are they have a kind of mutual attraction to each other. They're hanging out on this path and then they scare an old woman who is eventually revealed to be Doreen played by mm-hmm. Margaret Towner. And she is on her way to the Drax residence. So Doreen and Fanny played by Rita Davies are these murderous caretakers and they are trying to usher Mrs. Drax played by Rosemary Dunham to the afterworld so that they can presumably steal any money her and fortune yeah like yeah. they're poisoning her insulin because she's a diabetic and plan on blaming the wolves when she dies mm-hmm. that that it, from a from what will look like i guess a lack of i don't know whatever diabetes does well i think the original plan is actually that they were just going to kill her with the insulin and then they realize when other people start to get smart mm. to them, they think, oh, okay, wait, let's pivot and use the wolves as our excuse because that's easier. <laughs> we'll invent this story about how she's been sleep wheelchairing around the, mm-hmm. the grounds. <laughs> uh, that house is not wheelchair friendly. A. No! There's no way that she's getting out into the woods <laughs> by herself sleepwalking. You're totally right. I love it. <laughs> I didn't it. even think about that. <laughs> So they think that they have done their job and that she is basically on her deathbed. So they call the Drax family, who is comprised of her son, Mark, played by David Prescott, Mm -hmm. his wife, Mary, who is played by, oh my god, Angharada Rees. Sure. As well as their two children, Kester, played by Matthew Dean, and Polly, who is played by Leela Lloyd Evelyn. Question for you. I, I will confess, because I, I think that watch starting this, I had to really, like, you know, settle in the mood for this this type of film. Mm-hmm. I, I was actually having a lot of trouble figuring out who was who and in relation to each other for the first, like, 20-ish minutes of this movie. Uh, I watched it with subtitles, and that was helpful. God damn it. No, you know, I gotta, I gotta start following your methods, because that actually is the right way to go. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, wait, what are the characters' names? And then well, it was like, oh, they pop up. Thank God. Okay. I thought Doreen was Fanny for the longest time. There you go. Yeah. So Fanny is the one who's more assertive. She's mm-hmm. taller. And then Doreen is kind of the the jokester, but she's also kind of the dumber one. Yeah, she's the one we're <laughs> talking about communion. Oh, it makes me tremble when he puts that wafer in my mouth. <laughs> I love that both of these women are actively killing people, but also hot for the local priest. No, they're horny for the Lord. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> Very much so. I mean, anyone who has seen Fleabag season two knows that there are plenty of hot priests kicking around. So why not get yours? And in this case, <laughs> this movie has Father David played by Kevin Moore. I would not be hot for this guy. He is a bit of a dink. I mean, he's also older, but he's, yeah, he's also a prey. I, I was surprised we don't get any kind of, like, real comeuppance for this man. Oh, no. no like, it, I mean, that's part of, I think, the messaging of the film is that the church will hide its nefarious practices. Like, if you're an independent-minded murderer, you're probably going to get caught and go to jail. But if you have the Lord to hide behind, you can just sweep it under the robes. See, though, and uh, you are correct, but I'm also reading it as, but the real villain are the inter- the, the homophobes who were also gay. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you see so yeah, all those politicians that are like, you know, that are putting in anti-queer legislation, but they're also like, you know, fucking guys in bathroom stalls. Oh, you talking about Mitch McConnell, Lady A? <laughs> yeah, we see you. We see but, but, you. And I, I, th- 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 not even a comeuppance for this priest, but no moment of revelation where he's like, yep, what I did was wrong. He like ends the movie satisfied. Yeah, because you know what? Oh. He got more people to come to church on Sunday service. There you go. Yep. I love that in your morality story, you're like, but where is the comeuppance for the true villain? 
<laughs> that that should happen <laughs> unless it's unless it's a you know a drug tale in which it's like oh if you do drugs you're gonna die <laughs> trace did you not hear the academic article where i talked about how they subvert your expectations <laughs> it's part of the formula oh my god i'm remembering oh my god there was this one anti-drug like cartoon thing but it brought oh, in like no. all the different cartoons it was like the teenage mutant ninja turtles the chipmunks like, this oh, kid no. like tr- this kid like tried a joint and like all of these car it, because that's how they got kids to watch it. He's like, oh look at all your favorite cartoons like in this right. one movie. They're anti drugs. Yeah, <laughs> which is hilarious because I'm I'm watching this epics Blumhouse docu series, uh, true crime about like the Satanic Panic, and there were a bunch of people who thought that a bunch of cartoon characters and like cartoon mascots were symbols of the devil. So it's like, well, pick one. Pick one. Yes, exactly. <laughs> they can't be c- telling your children not to do drugs while also converting them to Satanism. <laughs> God. Okay. Yeah. So, so what happens is when Father David arrives at the house, he says, "Oh, actually, Mrs. Drax is doing super great, and these women are shitting a brick because they thought they were about to get a big payout." So this is mm-hmm. where we start to get the. You know, a lot of the movie is actually separated, so it's you're getting time with the wolves, and then you're getting time in the Drax household. And if you don't like one of the stories, then you're not going to like about 50% of the film. Yeah, and that's kind of where I sat. Like, I mean, I get the point of these old women. I get the point of all aspects of this story. You oh, know? sure. We, yeah. we have to have Kester the boy who might be a, wolf, a, a, a budding young wolf cub. Mm-hmm. Um, we have the old ladies acting as, like, you know, right-wing conservative conservatism. But yeah, it's just like, it just goes on for so fucking long. That's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Well, in that case, uh, let's jump back to the boys, the hot model boys with the, um, with who, the ears. <laughs> who thinks he's fat for eating bread. Oh, yeah. I mean, there there is stuff where I just think, this is so 1998. Yep, this is queer no. cinema in 1998 where we're talking about it's very fixated on like white pretty boys having real thin model beautiful physiques talking about afraid to be eating bread. Okay, yeah. but see, I I don't think that's limited to 1998. I think that's even valid for today in our world of instigays. I mean, the medium has changed. Yes, we we have shifted it from independent film to Instagram. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, all all I'm trying to say is that, like that that was a more nuanced aspect of queer culture incorporated, maybe be it intentional or not, where it's like you know body body shaming is rampant, mm-hmm. especially between gay men. So that that felt very um, not on the nose. That felt like a natural thing that maybe if you weren't queer or a gay man, you wouldn't pick up on like what that line was there for. Right. Yeah. It's definitely not something you always hear men talking about, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Now, something that is a little bit more on the nose and obvious is where they compared their familial histories. So I would like to do a dramatic reading of Seth's quote-unquote coming out story. Yes. I'd always suspected. I mean, mom used to tell me to tuck my tail into my jeans, and dad used to make jokes about boys like me. But it's like they just hoped it would uh, go away. Then one day... They burst into my room and found me in all my glory. Fur, tail, claws, <laughs> the lot. <laughs> they found him with a copy of his Wolf Weekly. There's also uh, a line where it's like, parents can always tell when their kids will turn out to be wolves. Uh, mm-hmm. It's like I, it's like they just hoped it would go away. It's like, okay, movie. <laughs> I get it. <laughs> you have to keep hammering this nail. Yes, but also I can imagine being a 13-year-old gay boy in the closet, watching this quote-unquote mm-hmm. horror-slash-independent <laughs> cinema film, being like, oh, I see what you're doing. I'm okay. I'm going to be okay. I could be a hot runaway boy, and I'm going to meet some dark and stormy guy, and I'll be okay. But that's what I'm saying, though. I've, it's so on the nose because those types of like after-school special things were the same way. This mm-hmm. is meant in my opinion, maybe maybe they don't think about it, but th- this should play for children, for preteens, for yeah. people, like, like, 10-year-olds, you know? If it didn't have the occasional dr- F-bomb or mm-hmm. the, the the sex scene, or, like, I, I, this would be totally fine to show kids, and yes. it would be a great learning lesson for them. Yes, yes. Like, th- this feels not like gateway horror, but kind of like PSA to kids, hey, yeah. you're going to be okay. 100 it gets better according well, to the wolf boys and, and yeah until the priest shoots you but yes yes yeah just stay away from 
priests and you're yeah. gonna be okay. <clears throat> Stay away from the church in general. Oh boy. I, I feel like religious people must absolutely fucking hate us because we just rail all the time. But. They don't listen to us. <laughs> oh, fair, 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 fair. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's jump back to the Drax house. We've got Fanny and Doreen bickering, and I just love their relationship where they're talking about what they would do if the other one died. You know, Doreen's like, I would take your pussy and we would just live a happy life oh living in your house. Dude, I, I, <laughs> I, I needed, cause I, I kept, I kept being like, is she, does she keep saying pussy, but it's a double entendre cause she's not a cat. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but, but I swear you maybe see the tail of a cat at one point And half the time you just go, is she talking about her pussy? Yeah. There, there is to me some lesbian coded connotations going on between these two. I mean, they're very well. I, I don't think you're wrong. It, it's never, it, but you're right. It's, it is just that it's coding. It's not mm-hmm. explicitly like no, no. W- we're not getting the secret reveal of the priest's tale, you know, with no. these women, with these women. No, but I will say I wondered for a hot second about the midway point of this film where they they would be revealed to be cats because there's a moment where Fanny is actually talking to her cat, but using an affectation like she's giving the cat a voice oh my god and i thought oh my god is she gonna transform into a cat and they're the lesbian cat ladies from scooby-doo on zombie island or apparently the neon demon because we're doing back-to-back fairy tales with like yes! <laughs> women who turn into cats stories yeah <laughs> you're totally right oh my god uh, but yes also to uh, yeah, also, yeah also zombie island <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. uh, okay so mrs drax has made a full recovery she is a bit of a battle axe she is ordering everyone around and everybody goes off to church and i feel like this first church scene is really important for condemning all of the adults in this town as not just hypocrites but kind of idiots because there is a long exchange between father david the dog and this, and this woman yes, yes! And this is griffin <laughs> who was talking about how she has to sneak her dog parsnip into the church okay but see and this was a bit of comedy that worked for me so yeah the, the conversation goes on a little too long but he's like oh yeah dogs go to dog heaven so they have to go to dog church mm-hmm. and this woman who's like again on this conversation just goes uh well, i've never heard such nonsense and just walks away mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's like you're talking about dog heaven and dog church and fucking bringing dogs to church and oh my god <laughs> yeah it i i like it a lot because i do think it's very like it reminds me of that british sensibility where you've got like i'm a big fan of the vicar of dibley and it's that kind of nonsense where you just think these are not real people but they are also clearly modeled off of a kind of small town mentality and it it feels real even though it is heightened ridiculousness but but then like that juxta her saying i've never heard such nonsense when you're in the middle of this like again wanting to bring your dog to church and mm-hmm. again coupled with like this against the anti-wolf regime of the, of these people it's like right. okay i see what we're doing here like okay, we're, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah it's hypocrisy but yes yeah it is not hard to unpack this is all surface there is no subtext yeah one hundred percent. So after the service, we're out on the lawn. We're basically talking about the quote unquote wolf problem. Uh, we get a bunch of amusing direct address, which I think is maybe one of the few visual flourishes that we get in this film. Yes. Yeah, I think I would agree with that. So Franny declares to Doreen that like this is where the idea sparks. They're going to use the wolves. And this is all intercut with uh, Gabs and Seth, you know, running through the fields, looking for food. They're talking about eating sheep. They're trying to avoid getting shot at. It's, you know, mildly amusing. It's kind of like Huckleberry Finn style. Like, let's go have a daytime adventure. Yeah, just without the racial element. But yeah, this is also when we yes, get the... thank um... you, Trace. <laughs> <laughs> this film is aggressively white, so we don't have to worry about issues of racism because black people and other people of color don't exist in this world i was gonna say there's no black people in the uk <laughs> just kidding obviously take a drink you fucker <laughs> no this is when we get the don't pull the trigger you squeeze it real warm and gentle like a woman's titty yeah just all <laughs> of just... these people are so weird because uh, i mean i just i say titty like oh it's a titty um mm-hmm. but titty titty <laughs> it's like when they say daddy I'm so sorry, y'all, if I'm butchering the uh, Cockney or whatever British accent that is, but, you know. Oh, it's okay. We don't have any listeners in the UK either. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. There are no queers in the UK. (laughs) Oh, my God. Well, no, they were all eradicated. The wolves were (laughs) shot. 
<laughs> the priest killed them. Yes. Uh, uh, we're going to hell. <clears throat> yep, we're bad. We're going okay. to hell. Okay, so because Mrs. Drax has gotten better, her son Mark has decided to fuck off. He's going to go back to the city, and he voluntold his wife that she and the kids are just going to stay. And then his wife has this fantastic line where she says, Okay, but don't expect sex the moment you get back. Okay, no, again, that, that, that too, I, I was literally like, what? <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. That would have to be removed for our preteen crowd. Mm-hmm. Adults don't have sex, kids. Don't worry. <laughs> Immaculate conception. That's where we all came from. Oh, my God. Uh, okay, so this is where we get introduced to the other wolves. So it's not just that there's two of them living in the in the woods. There's actually a whole kind of, like, pack here. So we are introduced to Gabe's lecherous ex, Michael, who is played by Alistair Cumming. And he... <laughs> I mean, he's doing that kind of, oh, there's a new boy in town. So he's trying to cozy up to Seth and telling him not to stray away from the pack. And... No, but th- but then he's also doing the, um, like, oh, but I bet you haven't told your new boyfriend your secret. So let me come around and tell you what that is. Which, mm-hmm. by the way, his name used to be Andre. And he Andre. goes, changes his name. And he's so fickle because he's that kind of wolf. Yeah. So, okay. I'm interested to see if you have a reading or a take on this. Because I definitely flashed back to my own name change story Mm -hmm. that i talked about in our what keeps you alive episode and i couldn't help but wonder if andre was trying to become a different person and someone who's less promiscuous and that's why he changes his name to gabe i i i get that reading my reading i feel like something i'm coming down on gay men in this episode but um i really read it as they're just fickle he's just fickle he can't make up his mind he has a lack of identity he doesn't know who he is so he just keeps changing until he figures out finds one he likes at the expense of any romantic partner he has because he's selfish right that that is reinforced by the narrative that we learn about gabriel because we yeah we We hear later that, you know, he's become infatuated with Seth, and it's the first time that they've ever seen him fall in love. And they can't believe it because he's the boy who never dates. He never falls in love. So that makes sense. Yeah, I and it that that is reinforced by what those wolves say. Right. I don't maybe not trustworthy, but mm. no, but but I, I, I this is again maybe a complaint with editing or something. But like I I don't really like I get that they like each other. I never really buy this like oh, they really, really love each other type thing until, like, the death monologue. Oh, for sure. Because, Trace, tell me, how long a time period does this film take place over? Oh, I don't know. A day? I can't figure it out. Is it a day? Is it two days? It's at least one day because we have to kill Mrs. Drax Drax, and her body gets found. But it's like, so are we just suggesting that these boys have met they formed an instant connection and they've fallen in love because yeah it is full-on romeo juliet drama well yeah because the thing we the thing we get is the second they start to get too close which is literally just seth like staying over at gab's like den Mm -hmm. tent thing (laughs) that's when gab's is like oops i fucked someone else right like i I don't know i I just i i never got this whole like oh they are so in love type Mm -hmm. thing but that, and I, that to me is an issue with the script. But I think so too. Yeah, we. it's weird because I think we needed to spend more time with them, even though we are getting a lot of time with them. But it's not enough to tell us that they are more than just like, honestly, I just kind of thought they were hanging out most of the yes! time. Yes, <laughs> me, me too. You know what we needed? We needed a fuck scene. Okay, well, yes. Now that you're saying it, I'm actually very glad that you have raised this because this film needs... Does this film have a problem with queer sexuality? Well, uh, see, again, this is when this time period is going to come in. So, yes, the, the the big elephant in the room with this movie is that the only sex scene we get is a straight sex scene mm-hmm. um, between Seth and Polly, the uh, Drax's granddaughter. But we get this kind of like rolling around the ground scene between Gabriel and Seth. Yeah, but they could be wrestling. I just wonder if they didn't want to include any like really explicit queer sexuality because it was going it was an independent film that's going to festivals they want a distributor and if you have explicit queerness in a film in 1998 or 2000 um it's maybe going to scare off potential buyers I mean I, I may be cutting this too much slack but that's what I'm thinking although that may not be the case Well I think it goes one of two ways so again I'm coming back to Hellbent where 
there is a reasonable amount of queer sexuality. Like there's a near implied sex scene in that film. And I'm thinking mm-hmm. of, you know, other queer, not queer horror particularly, but a lot of queer films that I've seen of that era. It's like you're either going shirtless hunks, you know, caressing, touching. There's never full like there's never sex scenes it's often just implied but lots of like nudity and like sexuality but those are the films that often tend to get relegated strictly to the festival circuit right but then compare that with the film we double feature with hellbent which is killer unicorn from 2018 2019 Mm -hmm. which does have a pretty explicit gay sex scene with poppers with condoms oh yeah and that's the difference that 20 years makes exactly exactly so i mean I, i don't I, I don't feel comfortable saying this film has a problem with queer sexuality because I also just don't know if anyone was comfortable putting it in here for purely financial reasons. Right. Like, we're spending $14 million on this movie. We would like to have it exhibited in a theater or two. But that being said, it's a problem when your whole thesis is gay is good, gay is great, and then you don't do any, like, you don't have any queerness in this, you know? Oh my god, have you read his thesis? Have you read the PhD? No, I have not. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but no, I agree with you. It It's very much a problem at the center of this film because we need to buy into this romance and it it just doesn't get there. Yeah. 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 It, it bo- I mean, again, these characters are explicitly gay. We know that. But it, it comes across as more homoerotic than it does mm-hmm. outright queer. Yeah. Yeah, they bond as opposed to like, fuck. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they do have sex off screen. They say that, but yes. yeah, we don't see it. We don't see it. We don't talk about buttholes. Um, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't talk about the curvature of the penis either. Okay, so we're at the church and we've got this service and Father David delivers the sermon that basically says, why do wolves exist? Well, because Kester asks him, Kester's like, why did God create wolves? And he does this whole thing where he's like, there were no wolves in the Garden of Eden. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, this isn't Kester. Because he he tells the story to Kester later, because we get this story twice in this movie, in case you missed it the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've got it that he's he's talking to Fanny, and that, that he's dealt with wolves before, they can't be allowed to settle because they bring disease and so on. And, so and on. trouble wherever they go. But it's, again, like, replace wolves with gay people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, that is, because again, that, that's, we also get something later where it's like, you know, oh God, I think it's Kester even that says, like, what wrong did wolves ever do to us? Blah, blah, blah. Where in the Bible does it say wolves can't exist or mm-hmm. whatever? And it, that's, again, that's the common things you hear with them. Um, yeah. Anything with queer folk. Oh, sure. Just head on down to one of those uh, Baptist protests of any queer person who's ever died and all Mm -hmm. sorts of good stuff. Yeah. Yep. Uh, There is a fun scene where Gabriel and Seth rob a woman. They basically do it so that they can steal her money so that they can go play games at the arcade. But I also loved it that she's talking about her baby and that carriage is clearly empty empty no baby in it (laughs) and i couldn't figure out if that was a joke or if it was like we don't have money for a baby (laughs) but this is the one where they're like circling and going yes (laughs) like with that much emotional inflection by the way (laughs) Mm -hmm. oh yeah they phoned it in because people are just automatically scared of them all the time the art hey but the arcade did this not feel like 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 a set that was out of place in this movie it doesn't Everything that we've seen of this town doesn't support the idea that they would have a kind of modern arcade. Yeah, and it's all and the arcade is like a queer den too, or a wolf den of sorts. Uh, well, not exactly, because the, when they go inside, the other boys call them infected fuckers. Oh, whoops, my, my bad. <laughs> 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 That's what my wolf dens are like. We're just tossing that shit around. Right, yeah, as as you do, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Poppers, infected fuckers, curved penises. Wait, what? Oh my god. Yeah, I'm going to have to get on these uh, these these subtitles. There we go, yeah. <laughs> so this is when Seth briefly gets mad because he hears that uh, Gabriel and Michael have slept together. Mm-hmm. But that is interrupted because they come outside and they immediately encounter Father David. And so they hop on a motorcycle <laughs> and then we have a high-speed chase through yes! the countryside complete with an EDM soundtrack. Yes, it is so bizarre <laughs> i cannot and but it's not even that exciting because they get away by making a turn 
Mm-hmm. And the car, <laughs> for some reason, cannot follow them, and they just plow no. straight ahead. I feel like we get some weird ADR where it's like, whoa! <laughs> <laughs> it's highly possible. Highly possible. I will say, though, I did enjoy the high-speed chase. I'm I mean, using no, air quotes for high-speed because it looks like they're going about 15 kilometers an hour. It It is hilariously entertaining, but I don't think in a way it's meant to be. Or, But maybe it is. Yeah, I don't know, because when they get away, it just seems so silly to me. Like, it it almost seemed like a Three Stooges kind of gag. So I don't know. Oh, almost even to the point where it felt sped up, like the film felt sped up. But maybe, again, maybe that's me misremembering. No, I I would support that. (laughs) So we are back at the house and Fanny is preparing her. So she's going to she's going to dose the wine so that she can have Doreen come over and they can finish the job with the insulin. So she's crushing up pills and she's stroking her pussy. Yep, uh, I have that quote. Hold on. Pussy wants her mommy to stroke her. I mean, how are we not reading some lesbian subtext into this? No, I I think you're totally right. I, 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 yes. (laughs) Yes, we are. (laughs) Either that or we need British listeners of whom we have none because they were all killed by the church as we talked about (laughs) earlier. If any of our UK listeners have survived the purge, please let us know, do you refer to cats as pussies? Yeah. Maybe this is just a nomenclature difference. It very well might be, but mm. I'm going to bet that it's probably a lesbian. <laughs> is it nomenclature or is it a lesbian? <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's your subtitle. Uh-huh. Uh, so this is when we get a exceedingly well lit dinner. It's like there's a spotlight on the center of this table and Polly has decided she wants to fight with everybody. She runs off in a huff and this is where Miss Drax tells Mary that she's frightened. So she's actually a little bit lucid, but she's also kind of been drinking this drugged wine. So she's starting to fall asleep. And this, I, the only reason I say this is because it's important that Mary becomes the person who realizes that there is nefarious activities happening yes, involving and Fanny and uh, Doreen. It is, but I don't think it's like, I, I wish, I, I like Mary as a character because, yeah. again, she's the one that becomes sympathetic towards Kester when she starts wondering, oh, like, what if my son is mm-hmm. going to be a wolf? Well, she's also not a fucking idiot like her husband. No, yeah, and she's also denying her husband sex, which, go girl. <laughs> yes, withhold that sex when you get stranded in the country. But, like, I, I also don't think there's enough of her. Like, I feel like, yeah, we kind of get this scene. We get maybe something a little bit later, but then it's like, oop, she's caught them at the end. Mm-hmm. Tally-ho. Yeah. I don't know. How How do we have... Maybe it's the 76 minutes. Maybe we just needed a little bit of a longer runtime, but I feel like we don't want that we just want better uh, it, uh, mm. almost even more of a focus like i mean again we're going back and forth between the family the old ladies the priest and the wolves that is four different like sects of people in right. 76 minutes so there's just not enough time to devote to everyone and as a result i do feel like it kind of hurts all of them in the long run but mm-hmm. you're right i don't really want this to be any longer i could almost do uh, I was like, I, I could almost do without the old biddies. I know they're your favorite; they're your funny things. But I don't. I think narratively, with what this film is trying to do, they're the last, like they're the least important part of this narrative. Okay, well, keep that in mind because we're gonna play a game at the end of this. Okay, talking about how we could kind of fix or gently update this film. Yeah. Okay. So then there's a scene that kind of plays like a thriller, and it's a little bit out of place, but I did quite enjoy it because Kester returns home after spending the day hunting with mm-hmm. Father David, and he ends up drinking the drugged wine, and then he sees Fanny having this conversation with Miss Puss. Yeah. It's a very weird thing. Like, he's standing on top of a ladder looking through a window because he hears her and she's stroking this cat that we can't really see and she's doing a voice for it it's it's very very surreal yeah it's it's i I remember watching this and just being like what (laughs) yeah like what is happening right now i'm intrigued but also i don't know Mm -hmm. so this is when doreen then arrives with the insulin and they inject miss strax under her fingernails i did not enjoy seeing needles going under fingernails in this movie that's actually how we're introduced to mrs drax as well because the first time we see her is that goddamn fingernail Mm -hmm. yeah i did not care for it Mm -hmm. 
And then Kester is falling asleep at this point. I actually thought he was going to fall off the ladder and die. He does not. He just climbs (laughs) into bed with his mom and he tries to say, hey, I saw or heard something. And they both end up dismissing it as a dream. But it's it will eventually be revealed that they are the two characters who kind of put this all together. Yeah, which fine. Yeah. But uh, not soon enough, because Fanny and Doreen have actually drugged up Miss Drax, they wheel her outside into the woods. They wheel her outside of the house with no ramps. With no ramps. Apparently these two, and these old women, we see them trying to push her across. It looks like a rocky terrain. And Doreen (laughs) is just like, she's heavy. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, but when I I say like old women, like these are old women (laughs) doing this. They're in their... I gotta think 60s or maybe 70s. Oh my god, I was going 80s. <laughs> Time is a flat circle. We have no idea how old these women are. They could be 35. But yeah, th- they leave this old crone out to die. Yes, after overhearing the wolves fucking on the other yeah. side of the hedge. Mm-hmm. And then we see that Gabriel crawls through the hedge so he sees miss drax there but we don't know the state of her and then the next morning when we come back up she is face down on the floor well on the ground and she's dead wait i'm sorry i I, i'm just going back now to like reading them as lesbians because now i'm like okay well let's say we are doing that and the movie's intentionally doing that then it's trying to highlight this divide between gay men and lesbian women yeah i took it to be that it it's kind of like these are queers who are out for themselves like they have a plan Mm. and they see a scapegoat and they think i can just do away with them i just like there is that stereotype that it's like well gay man and lesbian was like don't get along but i was like that's not really true but uh i mean for a while there it definitely felt like it was something that was being actively not capitalized on but like i worked at a gay bar and it was one of the few that actually had like an inclusive space that encouraged both gays and lesbians to mix. Mm -hmm. And there were always people who would talk about how they just felt like they couldn't be themselves because the opposite was there. And it was like, what? And it was because they were used to going to bars where it was like, this is the lesbian bar or this is the gay bar. And it was like, never the two shall meet. Side note, I don't think I knew you worked at a gay bar. Were you a bartender? I was a coat check boy. Oh my God. How old were you? 22 to 24 that is fascinating i'm just imagining all these people like people like all these men <laughs> walking by like hey coat check boy uh, it was the worst so i actually worked there what? with my ex the bad one and mm-hmm. he, so he would handle the money and all that kind of stuff and then i would run the coats back and forth and people would always leave the lids of their poppers open because they had taken a hit right before they came into the <laughs> bar <laughs> So I would just end up getting stoned off other people's poppers working my night job. And it was really frustrating. No, that sounds like so much fun. No! (laughs) Try being at work and getting stoned. Well, actually, now that I'm saying it, in hindsight, it sounds fun. Well, the popper's high isn't, doesn't last long, but I guess if you're like in a room that's just filled with open poppers, then Mm -hmm. yeah, you're going to be constantly getting those fumes. For hours on end. (laughs) For all you straights, if you are new listeners, go Google what poppers are on Urban Dictionary. Yeah, this one isn't too, too bad. You won't be confronted. No, yeah, there's, it's, it's, yeah, <laughs> you're fine. There's no, there, there's no bad pictures. Right. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. okay, so Miss Drax is dead, and this is, uh, yeah, so she's, she's dead. And this is when uh, Gabriel, I, I said Gabriel earlier, didn't I? This is when Gabriel and so. Well, you know, it's, it's because they keep calling him Gabs. Yeah, that is it. So this is when Gabs and Seth break up, and then Seth kind of walks away despondently, and he runs into Polly by the river. And it's important to note that she is wearing a red jacket, so she becomes our kind of red riding hood. Proxy. Oh my god. If you want to talk on the nose shit when we get to their um oh, yes. play dialogue. Mm-hmm. 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 <laughs> So apparently, if you can track down the DVD, there is a commentary by writer, producer Charles Lambert, and Mm -hmm. he says of this scene, what we tried to do was reflect a contemporary, more positive position where there's more equality, perhaps, between the wolf and red, and perhaps nowadays it's the wolf who needs rescuing. So this is, again, uh, symptomatic of the subversion or the twisting of a well-established tale to try to do something new. 
Which is totally fine. The problem is Polly has barely been a character in this film before this scene. Like, we do have her complaining earlier about the foo, but, like, there's mm-hmm. nothing else really that this character has done until this scene, yeah. which is merely to have sex with this wolf. Yeah, she she comes on in a big way. She, it's almost like she becomes this big character, but then she just immediately also recedes into the background. Yeah, which I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, I liked her chemistry with Seth. I liked sure. watching them talk because I was like, oh, hey, cool, we're getting because like, Seth is kind. He doesn't really have a lot of development. He's just mm-hmm. the the ingenue of the wolves, right? Mm-hmm. So get it, watching him get to open up to Polly, I think one scene after this, I was like, oh, like, I want more of this. This is kind of interesting because she's like the kind of outcast in her family. He's yeah. the wolf. Really interesting. Instead, we get this, um, <laughs> you have such a big, I have a really big mouth. Well, the better to kiss me with, Seth. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're basically doing their foreplay sexy thing while a very inebriated Doreen and Fanny have kind of played dress up and they're drunkenly dancing with each other. Oh, yeah. I definitely wrote dance together, question mark. <laughs> like, why are they doing this? I thought it was kind of fun. They, no, no, they I mean, seem I, to be I, enjoying themselves. But yeah, it's also like, okay, why do we have this? But Because they're lesbians. Because they're lesbians. And then this is when Mary and Mark return home. And Mark is just such a fucking bad parent that he confuses the sound of lovemaking for Polly being sad about her dead grandmother. (laughs) And this is not subtle sounds. This is like full on orgasmic moans. (laughs) Yes, this is the best sex that Polly has ever had in her life. And she's letting everyone in the house know. Yes, but the dad's (laughs) like, oh, she's just really upset about her grandmother's dying. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Which again, it's, it's funny. It's funny. It is funny. So while we're seeing this, we also then get to see Gabs at this Wolf Lake party. So they're basically having some kind of dance party for themselves over at the lake. And wolves just keep trying to come up and hook up with him and he rejects them. So they all gossip that he must be in love. He's in love. He's in love. Anyone who's seen The Little Mermaid on Broadway knows what I'm doing. I I feel like when you edit that, can you put in just like a little bit of backing to kind of like smooth it out a little bit? (laughs) Flounder has this whole song where he's like, she's in love. (laughs) It's a really good song. It's not a good musical, but it's a really fun song. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Well, I like that you're keeping it within the fairy tale canon. There you go. Okay, so, yes, where Kester and Mary have questions about Grant's death, Mark is oblivious. Uh, do wolves go to heaven? Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I suppose some of them do. Yeah. <laughs> some of them do. <laughs> I mean, I oh, yeah. appreciate that Mary's trying to be a good mom. You know, she's she is the kind of model, tolerant person where she says, I don't really want wolves no. in my backyard, but also they are people. But I also like I wanted more from that because again, so we we I guess we kind of get it at the end when she sing, she stands up and sings in church. I guess which is supposed to be an act of defiance of some sort. I think so, but it is weird that she sings a song called Jerusalem. Yeah, but we don't have her like we don't have any confirmation if Kester's a wolf. We don't mm-hmm. have um, a confrontation between Mary and the husband to be like your son's a wolf. Fucking deal with it. Like it's. Again, while I don't want this movie to be longer, I still want more from these things. <laughs> right. I kind of like that we don't get confirmation of Kester. It's enough to me that he's questioning. He's the I guess, I mean, Yeah, I guess he's not, the, he's not the, the central character of the story. It's just, oh, here's an aspect of queer life that people mm-hmm. don't always think about. Yeah. Well, it's also, it's pretty telling that Mary is the one who kind of has the head on her shoulders, but it's very clearly because she is a city person. Oh, I I didn't even catch that, but you're totally right. Because all of the people who live in this country town are fucking idiots and hypocrites. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Mm. Okay, well, let's get a breakup story. So this is where Seth sneaks out of the house post-coital, and he just decides that he's going to lord his masculinity over Gabs. Oh, my God. Yes. Yeah, you know, he goes, oh, th- that's, this is what it is to be a man, isn't it? Ugh. And like, don't, well, he's like, don't, don't you smell her on me? I'm like, ew. <laughs> it, it's a very, I mean, again, I think for baby gays who are, you know, fresh out of the closet, there is this idea that maybe you can fight it right Mm -hmm. like you don't really want to accept who you are just yet so you think okay well i'm gonna double down on the performativity i fucking love women oh my god give me them tits that ass that gushy stuff 
women. What I like about this, though, is that it's not. So you're right, yes, and that is absolutely what some what some queer people do is you know they, yes they will try to fight it they'll try to um, sleep with people of the same sex I'm sorry the opposite sex <laughs> too. <laughs> well they try to do that as well but but here's the thing though he's not having sex with Polly because he wants to reject being a wolf it's because he was hurt and mm-hmm. betrayed by Gabriel yeah. and that I I kind of like I, again I would have liked more like. Uh, unpack that delve. a little bit yeah a little bit more to it because yeah because you're saying oh i was hurt by this one man or this one wolf so i'm gonna go revert and like do something that doesn't come naturally to me although mm-hmm. of course he could be a bisexual wolf you know we never know i mean not in 1998 yeah <laughs> but but yeah i mean I, I think it's a really interesting path to take. again we're, it's just piling on all this stuff like mm-hmm. all these phases of queer life into the 76 minute movie indeed yeah so i definitely knew people who said, you know, if I ever broke up with my boyfriend, the one thing that he could do that would really aggravate me is if he went and slept with a woman. It wasn't even like, oh, if he just found some new dude to hook up with, if he just like fucked around everyone in town, that would be completely fine. But this fear in some gay men that like, their partners will revert, quote unquote, to heterosexuality no, I... is like a terrifying prospect. Um, I, I can relate. Not, not now. I've obviously since, I mean, obviously, I have gotten over that concern. But um, I have had partners in the past that have absolutely had sex with women. And I have even like vo- voiced, I mean, well, actually, that were even bisexual. And mm-hmm. of course, that's where a lot of biphobia comes from, too. Because oh, right? yeah. it's yeah, like, yeah. oh, like, oh, you, you, what if I'm not enough because you want something that I don't have, which mm-hmm. is a vagina um, and breasts and whatever. Like, and, I 100% when I was younger used to have that prejudice where I was like, oh, really? my, my insecurities were coming out because it's like, yeah, it's like, oh, wh- it, because you also like this other thing, what is there going to be a time where you want that and not what I have to offer? Mm-hmm. I don't, of course, I do not think that anymore. <laughs> right. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, in, in my youth when I was more insecure, absolutely, 100%. Well, I think it's an interesting piece, too, because the person that Gabs talks about at one point is that he was fucking this person, and then he went back to his wife and had kids. So it's yes. like, it's, there's almost this like, oh, okay, well, if that's if that's what you're attracted to, or that's who you don't want to be with, then I'm going to go oh. and sleep with Polly. No, I, I, yes, you're right. And that, that's why he does it. Yeah, because he's like, you you slept with a woman, I'm going to do it, too. Like, mm-hmm. okay, yes, yeah. Oh, my God. Oh, sorry. Am I having, like, flashbacks <laughs> to my own life? <laughs> I mean, that's what I'm saying, right? And I, I think you even just said it a couple moments ago that it's like, it does feel like they're trying to pack a really large, like, a myriad of queer experiences into this short film. But it, it's just that they don't quite give it enough time to breathe. So sometimes we miss the nuance. No, it, it's it's a greatest hits, or I'm sorry, saddest hits of queer life. <laughs> I will say I do like it when for no reason at all Gabs then warns Seth that if he's going to start sleeping with women he should be careful because women will bite your dick off with their tiny teeth. <laughs> like what? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Just some petty shit. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so then Gab says okay well if you want me I'm going to be out at the Rune Church. See you later. Mm-hmm. So this is when Father David tries to preach to Kester they're back on the hunt for wolves and Kester... I I just love it. He's not even walking alongside Father David. He's mm-hmm. actually forging his own path by walking ahead. And Father David is so desperate to try to convince him that he is right. And he ends up ultimately pleading to God. We get this uh, low yes. angle shot. Like we are God looking down on this fucking hypocrite priest. Just going, please hear me. Prove that I'm right. <laughs> Did you, I mean, I don't think there's a lot of narrative surprises in this movie, but did mm-hmm. you, were you surprised when we get the reveal later that he's a wolf? It could have gone either way. So if they hadn't done it, I could have just seen him as a hypocrite member of the church where it's like, oh, you're supposed to love everybody, but you clearly hate a bunch of people. But mm-hmm. the confirmation of it was like, ah, yes. Okay. I I, I almost preferred it. Oh yeah. No, I, I absolutely do too, because it. It it rings very, very true. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, the self-haters are the worst. And that they're doing it in 1998. Right. 
It's like Mitch McConnell saw this movie and then said, hey, I'm going to run for public office. <laughs> I mean, I, well, no, no, I'm going to I was going to bring up like the Catholic sex scandal, but no, right, I'm, no, I'm not, not going to do that. I mean, I feel like it is implied, but yeah, <clears throat> kind of. Yeah. I mean, because he's talking to this little boy, too. Like, uh, it's like he's fighting his urges. Yeah. OK, we'll cut, keep that in then. Okay. <laughs> Unless you want to, like, unpack it more. No, I mean, yeah, it's just like, you know, I mean, this is coming out around the same time that the, uh, I, I don't know if it's, like, the same time or right before, like, the Catholic Church, like, sex scandal with, you know, priests having sex with altar boys. Yeah. And by having sex, I mean assaulting altar boys. But... So, I mean, that's also interesting. But again, like, that's, I don't really know if I want to draw the same comparison because that's pedophilia as mm-hmm. opposed to queerness. Yeah, I will admit, as I started to get the impression that Father David may be a secret queer, and mm-hmm. I was thinking, oh, okay, you know, he's actively trying to recruit Kester. He's trying to spend time with him. There does feel like there's an element of predatoriness there. But again, the film doesn't really do much more than infer. No, yeah. Which, I mean, that's where, like, depending on the viewer, like, what what, what are you filling in the blanks here? Mm-hmm. So we have a wake from Mrs. Drax, and the community comes, and this is cross-cut with Kester, who has run away from Father David, and he ends up encountering Gabs at the river. And Gabs makes him, like, he, he holds out his hand to him, almost as a, you don't have to be worried, I'm not dangerous, but it also could be read as a, Hello, kindred spirit. Come with me. I will guide you. Yes. And Kester gets afraid and he runs home. And at this point, there's an angry mob forming. So his father, Mark, joins them on this wolf hunt, even though Mary is like, uh, I have suspicions about Fanny and Doreen because they're clearly killers. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Doesn't matter because the mob has already met up with Father David. He says, you know what, we're going to go to the church because, of course, at this point, he has also encountered Gabs and Gabs has actually scared him quite badly. Mm -hmm. So he knows where Gabs is. So he he galvanizes the crowd. I do want to make a mention. I think a lot of this film is on the nose some of it is comedically effective. The inclusion of a member of this small town in a KKK robe did not work. Very weird, right? Like it felt, I, I mean, it's just hammering home this message. But then again, mm-hmm. like, you know, through a 2021 lens, it's like, okay, well, let's maybe not compl- compare the plight of black people to the plight of queer people, unless you're also a queer black person. Yeah. And particularly in a film where, as we jokingly refer to, there are no people of color. So like, I, I get the intention. It's the same kind of just horrible mistreatment and misguided approaches, but it it really, it's so obvious and it stands out so badly. It just felt really tone deaf to me. Well, no, because it's it's like, hey, here is an apple and an orange. They're both fruit. They're the same, right? Mm-hmm. Like that, because, and so it's like, oh, here's a queer person and here's like, you know, sorry, queer culture and here's black culture. That The trauma they have is the same, right? Right. They're both hated groups, so you'll get the reference. Exactly. So yeah, it, it, it does, it, it's not, it's not a great inclusion. I will co-sign on that. Okay. <laughs> uh so seth ends up breaking up with polly because he has decided that he actually loves gabs they have this <laughs> tender kiss and then he runs off to the church who fucking late dude uh indeed yes because father david has already gotten there and even though gabs has told the priest that he's just like him or maybe because of it father mm-hmm. david shoots him oh it is because of it 100 percent and as soon as we get that reveal after this, it's like, oh, ding, 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 ding. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So sadly, this is where the Romeo and Julia part comes in because Seth gets there pretty shortly thereafter. It's a real twist of the knife, though, because he professes his love to him, not realizing he's already dead. Mm-hmm. So Gabs is just kind of sitting there, hunched, kind of like he's withdrawn into himself, but he looks like he could also be sleeping or he's just not making eye contact. Seth just pours his heart out about how he's realized what Gabs means to him and how he wants to be with him and he forgives him and he hopes that Gabs will forgive him and he's going on and on and on. You're just like, he's dead. Seth, he's dead. <laughs> it's very awkward <laughs> to, to be the, 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 the viewer of this. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll admit, I kind of foresaw one of them dying. But then 
to have Father David come out and have listened to all of this. And still shoots Seth. And then yeah. just shoots Seth. And so unceremonious. He just shoots him. And yeah. he's dead. And th- and this is when we get the tail reveal. He walks out. We got a tail under his robe. Bum. Yeah. So Father David goes out. He meets back up with the mob who literally have pitchforks and torches. <laughs> he dismisses them. We don't like what we don't understand. And yet it scares us. Are we still? Are we... It's Wait, the mob no. song from Beauty and the Beast. Okay, there we go. I was like, we're still doing fairy tales, but this is, yeah. Cap. <laughs> uh, so the mob just goes home. They pack it in for the night. They're kind of fine with it. I do love that Father David takes a moment to remind them to come to church in the morning, though. Yeah, I just shot two thing. people in cold blood. Don't forget to come to church, okay? There's like three minutes left of this movie, and I feel like all of this gets wrapped up very quickly. Oh my god, yes, because basically... <laughs> It is just like, okay, so the next morning, Mary turns Fanny and Doreen into the police because she overhears them talking about the insulin. So they're just arrested mm-hmm. and carted away. And I, I I wish this moment had have lingered a little bit longer because all of these nosy fucking neighbors, all of these looky-loos are standing out on the walk, seeing as the police arrest these old women. And we don't get that moment of catharsis where they understand what happens. We don't see them realize that they are hypocrites they're Mm -hmm. they're just nosy neighbors yeah exactly so i i would have liked something a little bit more but i guess it it lands for us so that's the most important thing so i i think what we have is this also the dog is still the dog is now tied up outside um which i love (laughs) (laughs) who parsnip parsnip yeah (laughs) um so that poor woman uh she the priest got his wish the dog didn't come into church yeah but Th- that's where this little coda with wolf heaven comes into play. So, you know, mm-hmm. we have Gabriel and Seth, they're in heaven. Uh, Norman Greenbaum's spirit in the sky starts playing and they dance as the credits roll with Mrs. Drax. Yes. with Mrs. Oh yeah. Right. Cause oh, sorry. So, so the wolf heaven is actually the regular heaven. There is no wolf heaven. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's supposed to be this like, well, they're dead, but you know, they're, they're happy. in a better place. They're together. <laughs> they're, they're dead happily ever after yeah um, the, the it gets better message got a little bit lost there because you shouldn't but, have to die for it to get better but it also does feel a little realistic right i guess even in 1988 especially the time period it's like well yeah the the, the, the conservatives the, the 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 homophobes the the right wing they're gonna win wow how no, dark is your fucking fairy tale, sir? Well, I mean, at least back then. I mean, again, we're living in a world today where, like, you know, transgender legislation is still, like, you know, being yeah. fought. I mean, again, all, all all queer legislation is still being fought. But, like, you know, there are things that are actively working against the queer community that are still there. And mm-hmm. so, again, 20 years ago, it's even worse. So it's just kind of like, yeah, this is a really shitty ending for it. Like, they're dead, but they're happy in that. And they're just leaving this horrible world behind. Yeah. that, And I guess it's that that intersection between the fairy tale where they get their happy ending, but that's just not realistic in the world that we've outlined in this film. So it has to happen in a different place. Well, and also, I mean, if we're really talking fairy tales, uh, most actual fairy tales right uh, the grim have, ones and the dark yeah ones. like they have sad endings or like depra- like again little mermaid ends with the the, the mermaid dying by suicide mm-hmm. yeah so I don't know. Well, okay. Well, with that said, because that is the end of the movie, I have Mm -hmm. two things for us to do. Okay. The first one is how would we modernize or Americanize this film? I mean, I'm going to repeat what I said last time. I would get rid of these old biddies. I would really hammer in more queerness into it. Um, I would have a queer sex scene. But I also think they'd be kind of fun with... I would honestly make it a little more horror-y, too. Um, I know we're keeping this fairy tale theme, but I would make it more of a dark fairy tale. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I think Freeway showed us a bit of a good model to work yeah. with, right? Um, where I think yeah. you've still got that biting dark humor, but you've got some some pretty significant carnage along the way as well. 100%. I would argue the humor in that film is more successful. But again, because of the subject matter that is that it's being humorous about, your mileage may vary. <laughs> right. Yes. And once again, folks, go back and listen to that episode. And watch the movie. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so second game, and this one's like a proper game. I would like to hear, because we've now talked about Little Red Riding Hood twice, and technically we've also talked about Hansel and Gretel. I would argue those are the two fairy tales that often end up getting adapted, particularly into genre or thriller crime fare. Mm -hmm. So I would like to know 
what is a fairy tale that you would like to see get made into a horror film? Okay, I mean, I, 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 I've, I've already cued us to this because I've already mentioned it twice, but I would, and given our affinity for aquatic horror, mm-hmm. I would love a Little Mermaid horror film. Right, and proper horror, not just the oh. Disney-fied version that we're about to get. No, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like you can give me the Hans Christian Andersen one. I think that's who wrote it with the with the death by foam suicide. But like, I also like. I mean, give me a sea witch. Like, I mean, yes. there's uh, w- one of the things is when she gets legs, it feels like she's walking on knife blades. Like, oh, so it literally hurts her to walk, and she's forced to like either kill the prince to escape her curse or kill herself, and she chooses the latter. Yeah. So. Man, we gotta watch the lure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah. The lure is great. Um, I, I know you like blew my mind a lot, right? Yes, I do. It's not quite that dark though. No, but I mean, like, there's a lot of body horror in a mermaid tale, True. and also if if you have it in the water, which again is gonna be impossible. You gotta have money for that shit. Mm-hmm. But like an aquatic horror body horror mermaid tale, like, give mm-hmm. me that. Yeah, I mean, the way that you're describing it, a hundred percent sold. Yes, sign mm-hmm. me up for that. Yeah, what about you? Okay, so I am going to draw from a very unknown one, and I'm going to credit a Forbes article that I stumbled upon with this. So a little bit of brief history. There's a reason that there's no gay fairy tales, and that is because around the time of the Industrial Revolution and the time of the printing press, there were folklorists whose job it was to create collections of folklore. So principally before this time, they were all oral, so they were passed down by spoken word. But during the Industrial Revolution, when we were printing books, it was like, cool, let's capture these, but also let's catalog them. And they were cataloged according to their structure, and they used this thing called AT numbers, or Arnie Thompson. That's the person who invented it. And one of the two individuals who was tasked with this job between 1920 and 1950 was a man named Stilth Thompson. And he did not like the gays, Trace. So he listed homosexuality and lesbianism in a section called Unnatural Perversions. And in that section, he also included stories that had bestiality and incest. And by categorizing them as such, he basically got rid of them because they were perverse or unnatural. So these stories were kind of eradicated as a result. But just to be clear, he did keep all of the stories with evil LGBTQ characters. So those made it into the catalog. Yeah. Yeah. So this Forbes article is actually about a Cornish writer and illustrator named Pete Jordy Wood. And he ended up discovering one that still uh, Thompson had missed. And it's a fairy tale called The Dog and the Sailor. So you can actually go out and buy this, apparently. Uh, He had to translate it from a couple of different Nordic languages. But the gist of this, and this is in Pete's words, is The Dog and the Sailor is... You've got this guy who wants to be a sailor who goes on a great adventure. He wins the hand of a handsome prince. There's a witch who is fabulous and ridiculously beautiful. She's a nice twist on the old hag routine. And the sailor's mother is overprotective and funny. There's a bunch of sexual innuendo. And the prince is a total dreamboat. But ultimately, it's an ancient tale with a positive portrayal of a guy who can be read as gay or asexual but certainly queer, who is the only person who can defeat the evil because he can resist her beauty. (laughs) Okay, you win this game. You did some, like, research on this shit. Meanwhile, I'm like, I want the Little Mermaid. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to bet that there are probably more people who sided with you and were like, oh, I would be down with Aquatic or a Little Mermaid. (laughs) Let me make her a lesbian. It's fine. Um, Yeah, no, I mean, that's awesome. Like, kudos to you, though. Yeah, I mean, it it just happened to turn up when I searched because I was like, I've never heard of a queer fairy tale and I wondered if they existed. And clearly I was not the only one. But uh, it's fun because the piece has some of his illustrations and they are very Disney-esque from what I could gather. So Mm -hmm. folks, that is The Dog and the Sailor uh, by Pete Jordy Wood, if you want to check it out. But I could do with, you know, some kind of Disney magic with a sailor who falls in love with, you know, a prince. And we've got like... a. A sexy witch cool so i mean yeah no i am 100 percent down for that shit 
Huh. All right, everyone. Well, that has been the Wolves of Cromer, and um, thank y'all for coming on this journey with us. So before <laughs> before we announce that we're covering next week, just some quick housekeeping to get out of the way. If you want to get in touch with us, you can reach us on Twitter and Instagram at Horror Queers, and join our Facebook Horror Queers group to hang out with other listeners. Also, find us on Letterboxd to keep track of all the films we've covered, and check out our YouTube channel to watch us talk our micro queries episodes. If you're tired of just hearing us, because because we have such pretty faces. It's true. If you have a moment, please rate and review us on your podcatcher of choice. Apple Podcasts is always the best one. And if you want even more content, please support the show. Please support me and Joe by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash horrorqueers. June has started, so we are kicking off the summer movie season, which I guess is technically May, but we're going to say June. Sure. Um, and almost everything is turning up Conjuring. We've got an audio commentary on the original The Conjuring and an episode on the new film, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It. We'll also be ranking all of the films in the Conjuring universe, so t- stay tuned for that. And in non-Conjuring related news, we'll have a summer movie preview and an episode on the new Ilana Glazer pregnancy horror film, False Positive. Yeah. And I want to clarify, I uh, because I don't like that Conjuring title, not because I don't think the new film looks good. The devil made me do it. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a mouthful. Let me put some marbles yeah. in my mouth. It's the name of the case. I don't know. Go back to the 80s or 70s or whenever the fuck it was and make them change the name of the case. Right. Yes. <laughs> but Joe, mm-hmm. we have non-Conjuring things to talk about next week on the main feed. What are we discussing? All right. Well, we are going to keep it independent, but we are going to leave fairy tales behind. And we're going to do some Anna Lynn McCord worship. So we're going to be talking about excision. I, y'all, okay, if you've never seen Excision, <laughs> if you've never seen Excision, uh, it's amazing. It is an uh, amazing, amazing film. Anna Lynn McCord uh, is brilliant in it, but like the cast, yeah. it's like Roger Barr, Ariel Winter from um, Modern Family, Tracy Lords, Matthew Gray Goobler, Jeremy Sumter, John Waters is in it, Malcolm McDowell, Marley Matlin, like, I mean, it is yeah. really good, but it's also very disturbing. Uh, it's, it's like... It's- Speaking of things that are, like, sexy dangerous, yeah. Yes. I promise you, if you Google this movie, you will have seen the most famous still from it, which is, like, Anna Lynn McCord, like, you know, reverse cowgirling a guy with, like, blood everywhere. Um, yeah. It's great film. There's probably content warnings to offer, um, so beware of that. I'm not really sure. Like, it's, Yeah, I it's can't so, remember, but... It's it, a really fucked up movie. It is fucked up, <laughs> yeah. So I'm super excited to talk about it. As am I. Uh, So yeah, until then, y'all, we can cross out the Wolves of Cromer. Yes, and cross out Horror Queers. You've made it to the end of another bloody disgusting podcast. Congratulations. If you like our programming, consider searching for other bloody disgusting podcasts, such as Creepy, Horror Queers, The Boo Crew, SCP Archives, Nightlight, Margaret's Garden, Nightmare on Film Street, and more. It was late in the afternoon when the professor and I took our way towards the east, whence I knew Jonathan was coming. Jonathan Harker has asked me to note this, as he says he is hardly equal to the task, and he wants an exact record kept. Dear Madam Mina, I have read your husband's so wonderful diary. Strange and terrible as it is, it is true. I will pledge my life on it. God preserve my sanity, for to this I am reduced. Safety and the assurance of safety are things of the past. I am in hopes that I shall see more of you at Castle Dracula. <laughs> listen to Regarding Dracula wherever you listen to podcasts, or find us online at bloody.fm.